All right, everybody. Um, well, welcome to another episode of Unlocking Cannabis with Key Investment Partners. Um, I'm Tibby Erdely. I'm one of the co-founders here at Key. I'm excited to have Jeremy Johnson here on the line with us today. Jeremy um, has been in the cannabis, cannabis industry for a while, um, currently working for Dispense. Um, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your journey into the cannabis industry, and, and maybe a little bit about what you do in the space. Yeah. Um, so in, in general, like going all the way back, I was kind of born into the industry. Um, both of my parents were, uh, as we call it now, legacy operators. Um, I don't think that's what we called it back then, but, <laughs> you know, that's that's what the term is now. Um, and then, you know, kind of kind of grew up in that world and got introduced to um, cannabis as well as the criminal justice system pretty early on, um, which, you know, had some unfortunate uh, effects, but also kind of helped shape my viewpoint on things. Um, and then when I turned 18, um, I'm, I'm from Michigan. And so when I turned 18 in 2007, we were voting on um, the Medical Marijuana Act here, the Caregiver Act. Um, so, I, you know, I was able to get in as a caregiver pretty early. And that's really, I guess, where I got like my personal start and I, you know, got my hands dirty. Um, and I, I stayed involved in the caregiver system for um, quite a while until we went recreational. Um, but I also got to experience um, medical and recreational out in California and Oregon. Um, so I kind of got to see how things you know, I, I got to vote on recreational in Michigan, California, and Oregon, um, which it was kind of a cool thing, just the, by the way, I was living in different places. Um, and then in 2018, when I moved, I moved back to Michigan full time to focus on being involved in the recreational market here, um, when it was clear that we were going to go recreational and um, helped get help help get some of the first dispensaries in my local area started up um help build out the digital experience for those dispensaries and then eventually transition to working for the largest non-vertically integrated operator in the state of Michigan and ran digital there um what were you doing for them yeah i ran digital for them so i was you know managing their online menus uh any digital advertising campaigns and then working on building out a full custom website. Uh, at the time, we were on an iframe solution. And that's kind of how I ended up at Dispense um, because what happened was that company got purchased by a larger company, SkyMint, who I'm sure people are familiar because they've been in the news a lot lately. Um, and so, you know, I kind of I got to this point where I was just frustrated about the with the lack of options for e-commerce. Um, because even though I was, you know, I'd been kind of working in cannabis as a hobby for a long time, um, my professional career was in mobile and web development, uh, specifically e-commerce. So, you know, from 2008 or nine until 2018, on and off, like I was building websites for toy stores, music festivals, um, car parts stores, all sorts of stuff. So that was, that was always my main career. And then in 2018, I was able to combine the two. And um, around 2020, when the pandemic hit was when I kind of saw the full potential of it, and then ended up joining Dispense uh, late 2021, I think it was. Great. Awesome. And for everybody's um, benefit, listening to the show right now, can you tell us a little bit about Dispense, what you guys do, the problems you're solving, um, where you guys operate? Yeah, so we're, we're an e-commerce system for dispensaries. And for those who aren't aware, you know, dispensaries, at least in the US, can't use your standard e-commerce. So like your WooCommerce, well, you can use WooCommerce because it's open source, but your um, Shopify, your big commerce, any of the big names that you would typically use to start an online shop don't operate in US cannabis because it's federally illegal. Um, so that opened it up for people like us, people like Dutchie, people like Jane. Um, and we power those online menus. So we sync with your POS systems, whether it's a Flow Hub or a Leaf Logics or a Blaze or a Trees. And then we pull all of your inventory um, along with, you know, test results, terpenes, 
um, cannabinoids, and then we display that for people to purchase online, whether that's through um, online pre-ordering with ACH or just picking up at the store and paying in cash. Yep. Nice. So curious uh, with regards to the online ordering, and, and you mentioned the ACH, um, do you guys offer that across all the markets that you're in or only specific markets? Uh, we, we can offer ACH pretty much in, I don't think there's any market that we can't offer it in. Um, you know, we actually, I think we're, we're launching in New York today in New oh, York. Um, yeah. I'm really, uh, good grades in Queens. Um, I think they're like maybe the fifth or sixth dispensary to open in New York. And oh. they're, they're one of the, New York is one of the few spaces where it's required to prepay for delivery. I think it is. Um, so I'm really interested to see if the adoption rates are greater on ACH in New York. Um, but in general, we see a lot of cash payments still just because um, ACH isn't the most convenient way to pay for anything. Um, people sure. would rather use their debit or credit card if they could. Yep. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. It's got to be um, certainly challenging kind of working in the different state markets where the rules vary so widely, like New York only allowing payment on delivery, et cetera. Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, this, we got connected initially because you had listened to one of our podcasts um, and you thought that there was a little bit of a lack of depth with regards to our discussion on criminal justice reform, which I think is a major piece of the entire puzzle here, especially as we work towards legalization. Um, so kind of taking a segue here, tell me a little bit about kind of your passion for the industry, why you want to see legalization happen, um, and what you think the roadblocks are to that today. Yeah. Um, so for, for me, you know, I think the first time my parents were arrested. I was probably in like third grade, you know, um, so pretty, pretty early age. Um, and that that affected me quite a bit early on. You know, I, I had to go through a lot of the system. Oh, sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> the You're criminal right. justice system, um, even, even in the schools, you know, that was a lot to deal with as a, as a kid and saw it. Um, I think I was fortunate enough that I, I grew up in a small community and had a lot of support. And my parents were always very honest with me about what was going on. Um, okay. And so I, I kind of saw it differently. You know, a lot of a lot of people, if they're involved in that, they might, you know, kind of shy away from that. And at times I did. But um, I, I was also lucky in that when my mom got out of prison for the first time, she enrolled herself in a criminal justice program. Um, and she, she was always fighting to like increase her knowledge. And, you know, now she works in rehab systems, um, and work does like a lot of work in the community. And so I kind of got to see that perspective too. Um, and that, that I would say is what really motivated me. You know, I just saw the kind of injustices, um, I, I also saw like the things that I benefited from being being white, um, very particularly, you know, like my parents got more chances than a lot of other people, especially my my friends, you know, I had friends of color um, who like their parents, it was one and done for them, you know, and then they they grew up without a father I or, or a mother, you know, and I, I at least got to see my parents. Um, they got second and third chances it was still rough, but I, I saw that firsthand. Um, and so that that kind of always in, inspired me to help make a change. And I'd say like high school through college, I was very involved, um, very much advocating for it at every level, um, even, even in D.A.R.E. classes, if, if anybody went through that, like I was the one that was writing papers about sensible drug policy. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think my dare officers like that much, right? But no, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Um, so that that was kind of my background in it, and I kind of shied away from it once I got out of college because I, I kind of you know I joined the professional world um, and kind of had to like grow up. And but I I always stayed connected. And now that I can like now that I'm in the cannabis industry, Michigan is legal, and I can feel comfortable. Um, speaking about it, I, I try to be vocal about it because I think at the end of the day, 
it's great that we're legalizing in all these different states, but it really doesn't make a difference if we keep it federally illegal because there's still so many people across the board that are being impacted, um, whether it's financially or literally with their life um, having to go into a prison or a jail system. And, and right. that's unfair. And it, it, hold, it holds, not only are we holding back the industry, but we're holding back real people and real lives at that point. Definitely. Definitely. You know, something that you um, said to me last time when we talked, you were talking about kind of the private prison industry and, and the lobbying against legalization. Could you spend a little bit of time talking to us uh, about your views there? Yeah. So, you know, it, the the lobbying, whether it's private prisons or federal, local or state, um, you know, our our government alone spends eighty billion dollars a year on our our prison systems. Um, to put that into context for the cannabis industry, last year the U.S. cannabis, the legal U.S. cannabis industry, was worth twenty seven billion dollars. Um, it's wild. Yeah. So so just our government is spending three x um, on prisons, and that's not including ancillary companies that benefit from it. Um, you know, and, and on the on the one end, you have private prisons that literally get money to put people in jail and are, are incentivized to have stricter laws. But then on the on the like less dramatic end of it, you have thousands of companies that are benefiting from government run facilities. So I'm, I'm talking about like the private, you know, because what happens is that the, the prisons, the jails, um, they outsource their services, right? From everything from telephone service to iPads to food. And so you have all these private companies that are listed on the stuff, well, private and public. Some of them are 100% private, but some of them are public. They're listed on the stock exchange. Um, you know, two of the biggest Two of the biggest REITs in the country are private prison groups. Um, right. Mean, meanwhile, you know we we can't even uplist. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. And so there's just this massive amount of money funneling into these companies and these systems that are advocating to keep cannabis illegal so they can keep their business going. And so, and so, what do you think is the solution here? Right. I mean, we've got you know, a vast majority of the states that now have some form of legalization, vast majority of the population, we're seeing decriminalization efforts across the board. You know, I live in Colorado now. It's very normal here at this point. Um, but even going back to where I grew up in Texas, um, ever since they legalized hemp, they've made it extremely difficult to um, try and convict people for marijuana offenses. People are getting let off because the cops can't even tell the difference between hemp or cannabis, right? Um, frankly, I think between us, we know there's not really a difference at all other than than a, a made up THC level in the plant. But nonetheless, do you see us trending in the right direction? What do you think is, what do you think are the appropriate next steps to get us towards um, I'd say effective criminal justice reform. I mean, yeah. on one side of the equation, I think that the black market has created a major headache for the industry that we're dealing with today. Take California, for example. Um, but it's really hard to regulate and hard to deal with because at the same time, you're not, you know, convicting people of, of black market crimes in the state anymore, unless it's, you know, major uh, or, you know, high quantity, if you will. So what, what are your takes there? It's kind of a, a difficult problem, but nonetheless, one that uh, has to be resolved before we get to legalization. Yeah, I, I think that like in our industry, a lot of people focus on like safe banking as, as solutions um, or like some sort of sweeping reform signed by like the, the president or something like that. And I, I think like, it's more it's more simple and more complicated than people make it at the same time. Like there to me, the reason why we haven't had real reform is because Congress is really the one that needs to act. And you know, yep. I, I, we've talked about this before, and like Mitch McConnell has an immense amount of 
power in in our congressional system. Um, and you know, you look once you when you look at somebody like Mitch McConnell and other people, especially in the Republican Party, but also the Democratic Party, they're being funded by these corporations. Um, right. so, you know, you you look. Um, I've got some notes here. I can read off here. Um, you know, Mitch in Mitch McConnell's top ten list of donors, um, he he counts Apollo Management Group. Um, I think it's Giads Gilad Sciences, Abvi, and Community Health Systems, which yep. all profit off of the prison systems. Um, I think, I think are, you sent me a note. I'm looking for it, but I think you said Hunt Companies was his largest donor, which is a private prison yeah. complex, right? Yep, yep. And, and Hunt Companies is one of his largest donors, 100%. And Hunt Companies, again, to compare it to the ca cannabis industry, they're vertically integrated in prisons. They design, <laughs> build, and operate prison systems. And this it's is actually not funny. I don't mean to laugh at that. It's just wild. It, it is wild. It's mind blowing. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm sure I have a note here that says exactly how much Hunt has donated, if I can find it. Um, from 2017 to 2022, the top individual contributor to Mitch McConnell's campaign is Hunt Companies. Um, and then my, my note right under that is a quote from the CEO of their parent company, um, which they acquired, they acquired CGL. Um, so this is Eli Gage, their CEO, mm -hmm. saying the rising popularity of private prisons coupled with a projected half percent annual increase in national incarceration rates will boost our overall, overall industry. So the, what better way to incarcerate folks than keeping cannabis as a schedule one? Exactly. So that, that kind of brings me to the point, like we literally have congressmen actively fighting to keep this drug as schedule one and keeping us from our goal of either descheduling or rescheduling to something like schedule three or lower um yeah. so until until there's more until, until we get campaign finance reform which probably isn't happening anytime soon mm -hmm. um, or until there's more money flowing in from the cannabis industry than there is the private prison industry and, and prison industrial complex I, I see it being a very difficult uphill battle um and i think you see it playing out at a state level too with people like ron de sanchez in florida um you know i i think true leave is a polarizing company um, in many ways, but they've donated close to like $20 million in Florida to get it legalized. And those are the kind of initiatives that I think will really actually move the needle um, because you have to fight fire with fire. Um, you know, if, if one group is over here donating $0 and the other group's donating $20 million, um, it's just not a fair fight at all. Yep. No, that makes total sense. I actually just shared a, a blog post with you that we put up, I think a couple of years ago, um, called the racist roots of cannabis, which I think take a pretty deep dive into a lot of what we just discussed here. But, you know, pe people will ask, you know, what does the private prison complex have to do with cannabis? Well, it's it, to oversimplify it, it just comes down to extremely low hanging fruit and a means to incarcerate people so that their voice is not heard on the political scene, aka vote voting rights are taken away. Oh, and frankly, human rights are, are taken away. Um, very, for a very simple, um, in our opinion, nonsensical um, reason. I mean, cannabis as a Schedule One is a hypocrisy. The FDA has already approved cannabis-derived drugs. Marinol has been uh, in use for cancer treatment since like the late 80s. Um, it makes no sense to say that the FDA says there's no medical value and then they're all obviously using um, drugs, et cetera, for the space. Meanwhile, so, opiates have medical medical value. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I saw a statistic. I, I haven't fact checked it, but I heard that opioid deaths in the state of Colorado are down something like twenty five percent since legalizing recreational cannabis. I, again, I haven't fact checked that, but I've heard it from several sources now. I think that's um, pretty. I mean, it's, across legal states, as you see a significant yeah. drop in those kinds of things, and 
you know, I, for, for those who aren't aware, you mentioned this, I, I want to be clear on this. Like if you if you have a felony offense, you you no longer have the ability to vote. Um, so, you know, that that's a huge thing. Like you were right. saying, like it's literally silencing people. And, and another good statistic to put that into perspective, um, the latest one I could find was from 2019. But there were more people arrested for cannabis in 2019 than there were for violent crimes across the entire U.S. So there were 545,000 people arrested for cannabis in 2019. There were 495,000 people arrested for violent crimes. So that's yeah. how skewed it is. It's over half of the people getting arrested are for, for cannabis crimes, um, not just drugs, but cannabis crimes. And then 45% of our federal U.S. prison is drug-related offenses. That's 160,000 people in prison wow. that can't vote, that don't have a say for drug-related offenses. I'd be curious of those 500 plus thousand folks that were arrested for cannabis, like what the possession amount was. And I'm sure there's a shocking <laughs> yeah. figure that many are, you know, personal use or, you know, buying for the week or, or whatever it is, which is yeah. well, quite a, unfortunate. A lot of them too, you know, it's not even, it might, the po actual possession might be zero. Um, they might've just been on their way to buy something. Um, and so you get people literally locked up for just trying to buy cannabis, which is, it's crazy. And they might not have even had it on them, um, which is even, even more unfortunate, I think, but that to, to your point, it's the easiest way to put people into our criminal justice system, whether it's local state or federal prisons or jails, cannabis is the easiest thing. You can smell it. You can see it. Um, it's not like, it, widely you know, it's widely used i mean for all, for all the right reasons yeah so, what, so where, where it starts to get especially convoluted these days is you know all of the different state and local laws even down to the municipalities they're they're all so contradicting how does someone prevent themselves from getting caught up in the criminal justice system today when the TSA, I mean, for example, they're not really stopping people from flying with marijuana anymore unless it's like an egregious amount. But if it's for personal use, I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal just this weekend saying basically giving people the blessing to fly with weed yeah. now, which I thought was was hilarious. But you you've got an article saying, hey, it's OK. And you're flying from Colorado to Texas, where it's certainly still not legal. How, how does somebody even navigate these uh, these systems today? Yeah, I think that's a great question that probably very few people have the answer for. Um, I, I think it's always better to be safe than sorry, you know, like, especially if you're like in an at-risk group, um, you know, there's, there's, I think there's an old saying, if, if you're going to break a law, only break one at a time. <laughs> yeah. Know? So it's, it's exactly. like, if you're if you're speeding, maybe if you're if you're prone to speeding, maybe don't bring weed in the car with you. Um, sure. And and I think you just have to be mindful about it, even in legal states. You know, there there are still in in Michigan and other states, but in Michigan specifically where I live, there are still people being arrested for cannabis today, even though it's fully recreational. Right. Um, you know, there, there's a court case that's only a few years old right now where a a licensed caregiver um, growing at home was arrested and convicted of possession because his child showed up smelling like cannabis at school. And so not yeah. only was he arrested and convicted, but his child was taken away from him all because he was growing cannabis at home under a medical provision. That's insane. No, that's, yeah. that's super sad. So I mean, I, I think wish, I, I think it's one thing that for how to navigate it, but I think when you have situations like that, there there is no answer on how to navigate it, other than I mean, I, I guess be as careful and cautious as possible, given that the rules are so conflicting and, yeah, um, frankly, so subjective. I mean, somebody who's given you know a medical grow license to have to deal with with what's going on, it's extremely sad to hear. I think, uh, look, I think my big takeaway here is that we are unfortunately 
still a far way off from having the right criminal justice reform in place. Um, it feels like from the outside looking in that the industry is is legalizing, you know, it's it's growing, et cetera. But there's a lot of problems. I I I always take kind of a hindsight view into everything that I feel like we've accomplished, but it, it feels like it's all been done backwards. Really, it's like we're moving this forward for, frankly, capitalist reasons, but we're not solving the problems um, of why cannabis was made illegal in, in the first place, which is it's it's really sad. It makes it for a very tough environment for folks to operate in. Um, it's confusing for folks. Um, and unfortunately, people are um, caught up in in making simple mistakes like like the gentleman that you just described there that gets them caught up again in the criminal justice system for something that they thought was they were doing totally above water and, and the right way so it's it's certainly not uh we still have a long ways to go is really what what it comes down to yeah and i think that's that's my biggest thing and like why why our conversation kind of started is because i i get frustrated from being I, I work in the cannabis industry, but I was also somebody that was affected pretty severely by the war on drugs. And so I get frustrated seeing a situation where I'm benefiting from it, other people are benefiting it, but we're not addressing the root issues. Um, and so that's that's where like, I, I really do have appreciation when I see something like truly donating 15 to 20 million to legalize in the state of Florida. Because right. that that is what it takes. You know, we can all sit here all day long and say that, oh, we donated 10 or $20 to the last prisoner project or, you know, my, my company sponsored an event for LPP or one of these other initiatives. But unless you're putting real money behind it, we're not going to get change. Um, and when I say real money, I mean, we've got MSOs out there that are are literally, you know, I mean, you start to break down some of the, the sheets and maybe some of them aren't doing as good as they, they look, but real money is being, being made here. Um, millionaires are being made. Wealth is being created. And, and we need to be reinvesting that into reform, not just for the sustainability of our industry, but for the sake of our, our community and, and the people that are affected by this. You know, it's, it's it's a travesty to have a bunch of people get rich off this and not help the people that were brought down by it. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we've had a pretty close relationship to the folks over at LPP um, here at Key for all the right reasons. And, uh, you know, something else that we're doing that I would encourage the other funds out there to do is we work closely with another lobbying group who then works with our portfolio companies. Um, lobbying for all sorts of things, but the, namely getting cannabis legalized in their in you know new states for them to go jump into. But I totally agree. I mean, uh, until we put our money where our mouth is, it's going to be tough to uh, to get the right reforms out there. Otherwise, we're just going to continue kind of down the path where we we have today, which is no federal reform, states taking cannabis legalization on their own accord in defiance of the Fed, and the Fed choosing who they want to incarcerate or not, which is giving them the power to. Um, you know, cr you know, make unfortunate decisions. Like uh, again, I, I just can't stop thinking about the gentleman you just described who who lost his boy um, for growing weed. Yeah, I wish I I wish I could remember his name because it's a case that got a lot of attention a couple years ago. And I mean, there's so, there's so many of those though. You know, you kind of yeah. track after how many of their them there are. Um, one one thing I did want to mention that is like, if anybody's interested in what we're talking about, there's one specific resource called worth rises um okay. that their whole goal is to map the private private prison industrial complex um and so if you're curious about like you know is my congressman or is my senator donating to these or being given by these businesses like you can actually go in and look that up um there's a ton of data public out there about that anyway but like this one is specifically geared at seeing the the effect of the prison industry yeah i appreciate it i'd never heard of them before but i've got it up on my browser now so i'm i'm going to take a dive in here so i appreciate you uh, sharing that with us so for everybody else that's worthrises.org well yeah. jeremy um 
I really appreciate you taking the time to join the podcast here today. Um, your perspective, I, I think, is a very important one and one that's unfortunately not talked about enough as we talk about, you, you know, what we're all kind of working on on the day to day. But I think it's important for folks out there to realize that the reason for legalizing cannabis in the first place is to right a lot of wrongs and injustices that have been going on since the initial war on drugs started, since cannabis was made a schedule one. Um, I highly encourage people, no pun intended, um, to check out our, you know, our blogs, again, the racist roots of cannabis prohibition and the argument for social justice reform, I think is a, it was a really fantastic blog for folks to kind of really start to get their feet wet, um, take a deep dive into the private uh, prison industrial complex. I think that you'll learn a lot about what Jeremy was discussing today. And, you know, reach out to your congressman, reach out to your senators, um, look at groups like the Last Prisoner Project. Um, look at groups like Worth Rises. I, I, I don't know them yet, but um, nonetheless, I trust Jeremy's judgment there. Um, and if you want to have your voice be heard, have your voice be heard. Talk to talk to uh, talk to your lawmakers and, and try to get something done. Yeah, and not not just your lawmakers, but talk to your dispensary, especially if you're in a limited license state like Illinois, where it's run by MSOs. Like talk talk to them. Talk to yeah. Talk to your bud tenders. Have bud tenders put pressure on their managers. Have you know money where your mouth is? Yeah, yeah. Be or, or you know if you're shopping at a dispensary that's not supporting this kind of stuff, or or one that's like actively kind of just here to make money. Like maybe think about where you're shopping at. I mean, you people like you and I were we're in this industry to make money. I mean, everybody is right, and some of us it's more personal than others, but like there's some people who just see this as a, as an opportunity to get rich and nothing else. And if that's all you're here for, my opinion is that's probably not the right reason to be here. So not the right reason to be here. Yeah. Well, I can certainly say that it's, it's especially in the last couple of years, it's not an easy industry to operate in. So if you're only in it for the cash, <laughs> you might as well go find something easier to do. Totally. Go, go buy some real estate. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's other more lucrative investment opportunities out there. Um, but hey, Jeremy, I really appreciate your time again today. Um, excited to keep in touch here. I think as uh, as we see reform happen, which you know, fingers crossed, I think we will. Um, it'll likely take time. Um, I'd love to kind of keep the dialogue going here, um, keep this conversation going. If there's something that you think is really exciting or, or something um, really saddening, also um, let's let's talk about it. Let's get on the podcast and let's keep people apprised of kind of. Where things yeah. really stand from a from a boots on the ground approach, absent think, of the capitalist, uh, you know, opportunity here. Totally. Unfortunately, we'll probably see a lot more sad stories before any real change. But I think one of the interesting ones is going to be Florida. You know, if if True Leave can show that monetary donations make a difference, um, even in the face of uh, other strong donators on the opposition. Um, maybe that'll pave the way for, for federal change and federal donations. And, you know, I, I think one thing we haven't mentioned yet, but uh, Ascend and I think Truly might've been involved. I know there's a couple of MSOs. They made a motion last year to, to sue the federal government um, on several grounds of, of why cannabis should be rescheduled. And that hasn't done, there hasn't been much updates in that recently. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if if truly can win in Florida, um, maybe we'll start to see some more progress there. So I think that's probably the most interesting one to watch right now. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. I think it'll, to your point, it could set a precedent and maybe give others the courage to come up and, and start lobbying the same. Yeah, nobody wants to put their money somewhere where they're not sure if it'll make a difference. Um, that's right. And and so, you know, one, uh, I applaud truly for being one of the first to really do that. And then two, if they can do it, Hopefully, a bunch of other people jump in on it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I, first of all, Florida is one of our favorite states to invest in for all the all the right reasons. And truly, obviously, being you know the largest, most well known operator there for everyone's benefit. You know, on the podcast right now, they are publicly traded. So if you want to support a company that you feel is doing the right thing, um, you can certainly go out there and purchase their uh, their public currency. Yeah, I, and I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, on a, to end it on a positive note, um, 
I think Miami would, will probably be one of the coolest places for cannabis culture once it's finally rec recreational. I mean, like, oh, yeah. the amount of like outdoor areas, poolside, like, it's just, it's the ideal environment to sit back and smoke a joint, you know? Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I was down in Miami like two or three weeks ago um, for some work meetings and it feels like the cannabis culture is already caught up there. You can certainly smell it on most street corners these days. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot easier once uh, once people aren't kind of looking over their shoulder. Totally. Awesome. Well, Jeremy, I really appreciate your time today. I hope that you have a great day. Thanks for sharing your story with us, and and I appreciate your your perspective here as well. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it to be. Cheers, guys. Bye.